Hello YouTube, this is Douglas, and today we'll be building the classic game Pong. We'll be using the Rust programming language and Geese. So what is Geese exactly? Geese is an event system library that I've developed for use with a number of my hobby game dev projects. Geese is a way of architecting or designing one's code, much like the model view controller pattern or the ECS queries that one writes when using Bevy. In Geese, one declares event systems, which can listen for events and send events to other systems. These systems can depend upon one another in a directed acyclic graph which makes the whole thing very modular, and it's easy to add or remove components and communicate between them. I've mentioned Geese in a couple of my other YouTube videos, and several people have asked about a tutorial and how to use it. So today, we'll be building a simple game, and I'll talk about some of the common idioms and ways one can use Geese. This tutorial was inspired by Tonton's breakout video, so let's dive right in. The first thing that we're going to do is initialize a new project using Cargo. We'll open the cargo.toml file and add two dependencies, one being geese, of course, and the other one being a library called macroquad, which we'll be using to handle input and output and drawing to the screen, since geese is not a game engine, just an event system library. Next up, I'm quickly going to edit our main function to be compatible with macro quad, and I'll set up a window event loop that runs every frame. Now that we have the event loop set up, it's time to start creating geese systems. The first thing I want to do is draw to the screen. After importing the geese library, I'll create a struct called game graphics. The game graphics structure will have a geese context handle, which allows it to call back into the geese event system access its dependencies, and raise events for other systems. To declare this as a geese system, we'll implement the geese system trait, and inside this trait we'll need to define a constructor, which in this case will simply create a new instance of game graphics with the provided handle. Now, we're going to need a geese context to hold the systems and their state. So we're going to create a new geese context in our main function, declaring it mutable because we're going to be editing it, and we're going to instruct Geese to add the game graphics system to this context by flushing an event cycle. And so we're going to use the flush method to create a new event cycle, and then we're going to add one event to it, that being the add system event. Now, the context knows that we want a game graphics system as part of the context. Once this event cycle completes, Geese will have initialized a singleton instance of our game graphics system. Now, since our game graphics system is responsible for drawing every frame, we need to instruct it to paint each frame. We'll do that by declaring a new event. The way I like to do this is defining all of my events in a module called on. So here I'll create a module called on and then a structure called new frame. And this event will have one member that just being the time it took for the previous frame to complete. So now I can write on new frame, and I can flush on new frame events the same way I used the add system event, by just doing context, flush, and then passing in any events that I want to flush. Uh, in this case, that's going to be on new frame. And for the delta time, I'm just going to use the macro quad library to get the time that the last frame took. Continuing on, we need an event handler for this event in our graphics system. To declare an event handler, we create a new function which takes a mutable reference to self and a reference to the event type in which we're interested. Any type can be an event as long as it's send and sync. Here, I'll just make the draw game event handler print to the console so we know that it's being called. Next, we need to register this event handler with geese. We can do that by declaring the event handlers within the geese system trait implementation. We create a new event handlers instance, and we add our event handler to it using the with function. Now, if we compile the code and run it, the console is spammed with the phrase I was called, so we know that indeed our graphic system is being invoked every frame. Next up, I'm going to do some quick math so that we can make our game independent of screen resolution. 
If the user squishes the window, making it very narrow or very tall, I don't want the proportions of the Pong game to get out of whack. So what I'm going to do is write a quick script that clamps the dimensions of our game to the biggest square that one can draw inside the window. So the square would look like this, or for example, this for varying window sizes. And this will just make it easier to work with coordinates in our game because now our entire game world just ranges in this square from zero to one. Now it's time to start drawing the paddles. To do this, we're going to need to store some information about the game world. So I'm going to create a new game world structure that stores all of the internal state of our game. And right now I'll just put the two paddle positions right there in the game world. I'm also going to add the default trait for our game world so that it has an initial state. And I'm just going to make it so that the paddles initially start in the middle of the screen. Now we need an instance of this game world on which to operate. We are going to declare a dependency for our game graphics system and that is going to be a store of game world. Stores are special kinds of geese systems that basically take in any arbitrary struct and turn them into a system. They're basically like dummy systems, they don't respond to events, they don't have dependencies. They just store some mutable singleton data that can be accessed and stores initially start out with whatever the default constructor is for their type. So in this case, the store of game world is going to start out with the values that we've defined down here. I also realized at this point that we need a width and height for our paddles, so I added those to the game world as well. After this, I'm just writing a couple of quick functions that allow us to take the world coordinates of our paddles, or really any arbitrary rectangle, and convert them to pixel coordinates on the screen so that we can draw them. Now that that's out of the way, it's time to actually draw the paddles. So for this I've created a new function that draw game calls every frame. The first thing that we need to do is get immutable access to our game world store and we can do that by calling the get function on our context handle. This gives us a system reference to the world and we can immutably access all of Game World's members. After this, it's a simple matter of just calculating the rectangles for each of the paddles from the data we have in the world struct and using macro quad to draw them on the screen. Running the game now, paddles appear on either side of our screen. Perfect. Next up, I want to make the paddles move. We'll do this by creating a new GI system that I'm going to call Game Input. Once again, game input will store a context handle that allows it to access the geese context. And we'll need to implement the geese system trait for it once again. First, we'll define a constructor which stores the geese context handle that we receive. And once again, we'll need access to the paddle positions for the game world. So we need to make the game world store a dependency. But this time we're going to be updating the positions of the paddles, so we need mutable access to this game world store. And we can do that by wrapping our dependency here with the mute type. And so this tells Geese that we are going to mutably depend upon our game world. Now I want a function that moves paddles every frame. So I'm going to declare a new event handler in the same way we did previously by creating a function that takes a mutable reference to self and responds to the on new frame event. In addition to creating the function, I need to add it to the set of event handlers down in the geese system implementation. And I do that by creating a new set of event handlers and using the with function. Back inside the move paddles event handler, we need to get mutable access to the game world so we can update it. And we do that by calling the getMute function on our context handle, specifying that we want to get the game world store type. And this gives us a system reference that allows us to mutably access the game world's members. Now I'm just going to calculate the amount of movement for the paddles over the course of the frame, and then use the macro quad library in order to check which keys are down and update the paddles accordingly. For the left paddle, I'm going to use the W and S keys to move them up and down and for the right paddle I'm going to use the arrow keys. Next up, because we created a new system, we have to add it to the geese context and we can do this by adding a second event to the event cycle that occurs on startup. And we just need another add system event that instructs geese to add the game input system. If I run the game now, we have two paddles 
and by using the arrow keys, I can move them up and down. There are some slight problems. The paddles can go beyond the bounds of the screen, and the movement was inverted on my keyboard. Pressing up made the paddle go down and vice versa. So I'm quickly fixing that now by inverting the movement again, and then clamping the paddle heights so that they always stay within the bounds of the screen. Now, when I run the game, I can't move the paddles beyond the screen borders. With the paddles out of the way, we have to do the ball. So I'm going to add some additional state here to the game world, namely the ball position, the velocity of the ball, so we know how to update it each frame, and I'm also going to store the ball's size. I'm going to refactor the game graphics a little bit and update our function for drawing the paddles so that it also calculates the rectangle of the ball and draws that too. Running the game now, there's a ball in the center of the screen even though it doesn't move. So let's change that. To manage the ball, I'm going to create one more system called the game physics. Once again, this stores a handle to the geese context and we implement the geese system trait for it. Like the game input system, the game physics system is going to be updating the state of the world. So we'll need the store of game world as a dependency and it will need to be mutable since we'll be changing the ball's position. We want the game physics code to run every frame, so I'm going to create a new function called moveBall that also responds to the onNewFrame event. This function will also use the getMute method on the context handle in order to gain access to the world store. Next, I want to make the ball move by changing its position based on its velocity. So I'm going to take the ball position and add the ball velocity to it multiplying by the amount of time that the last frame took to occur, and I get that time from the new frame event. And just like before, we need to instruct Geese to add this system to the context. Now when we start the game, the ball immediately sails off into the distance. I'm going to briefly refactor the physics code that we just wrote, and I'm going to switch the ball moving code to a new function so that we can also do the collision code in separate functions. I realized at this point that I would need to calculate the paddle and ball rectangles in both the graphics and game physics systems, so I refactored that logic into functions on the game world struct, so I could call it in both places. Afterwards, I wrote this function for calculating ball collision against the paddles. It gets the ball rectangle from the world struct, and then checks to see if the ball rectangle overlaps with one of the paddles, whichever paddle is in the direction that it's moving. So if it's moving left, it checks to see if the ball rectangle overlaps with the left-hand paddle. If it's moving right, then the right-hand paddle. And if there was a collision, it just inverts the ball's x velocity, so it sails in the opposite direction, and then chooses a new y velocity for the ball. If I run the game now, the ball immediately bounces off of the paddle and then sails off into the distance. So we need to do collisions with the walls. This is very similar to before. I just add another function called collide ball with walls and I call it from the move ball event handler, which is invoked every frame. I get a mutable reference to the game world store. I get the ball rectangle and then I check to see if the edges of the ball rectangle are beyond the game world's borders, which are 0, 0, and 1, 1. If the ball is beyond a border, then I simply invert its velocity so that it sails back in the opposite direction. I do the same thing for both horizontal and vertical collisions. When I run the game now, we've almost got a working example of Pong. The ball bounces around, the paddles are movable, and you can hit the ball to adjust its speed and direction. All we're missing now is a way to win or lose the game, so let's implement a game over screen. To implement a game over screen, I want the graphics system to draw something different, so we need to notify the graphics system whenever the game ends. We'll do this by defining a second event. I'm going to put another struct in the on module called game over, and in the game over, event I'm going to store whichever player was victorious as a number, either 1 for the left-hand player or 2 for the right-hand player. We can tell when the game is over using the game physics system. Whenever the ball hits the left or right wall, instead of making it bounce, we'll now make the game physics system emit an event 
to tell other systems that the game is over. And to do this, we can call the raise event method on the geese context handle. We'll do this for both the left and right hand walls, and we'll just change the argument to our on game over constructor. So either player two wins or player one wins, depending upon which wall the ball hits. Next, in the game graphics system, we need to remember which player won the game because we want to display a message persistently over multiple frames, not just immediately when the ball collides with the wall. So in the game graphics structure, I'm just going to add a winning player variable, which stores an optional number. So if this optional value is none, then nobody has won yet. Otherwise, a certain player has won. We're going to update this winning player variable by listening for that on game over event from earlier. We can do that by defining another event handler, a function called end game, which will take a mutable reference to self, also a reference to the on game over event that was emitted. We're just going to make this function check to see if the winning player variable has been set already. If it hasn't been set yet, then we update the winning player and we can register this function as an event handler with geese just like before. We just use the with function to add it to the list of event handlers from earlier underneath the draw game function. Last but not least, we need to make the game graphics system draw something different once the game has been lost or won. To do that, I'm going to check if the winning player variable is set here in the draw game function. If it's not, we'll render everything just as before. If there is a winner though, we'll do something different. I'm going to clear the background to a different color and then draw some text which states which player has won the game. And if we run the game, that's it. We've built a fully, completely working Pong. When one player misses the ball, the game switches to a different color and states which player has won. This is because the physics system detects that the ball hit a wall and raises an event to which the game graphic system responds. There's one more thing that we can do to clean up the code here. We have these systems down in the main function that are all being registered with the context. But we can reduce boilerplate here by declaring another system. We'll call this system Pong Game. And as dependencies for Pong Game, we'll list all of the systems. So Pong Game will depend on the game graphics system, the game input system, and the game physics system and we'll tell Geese to load this Pong game system, at which point it will load the Pong game system and all of its dependencies. And that's all. In just 20 minutes, we've built a fully working game using Geese and Rust. The great thing about Geese is how modular it is, because dependencies can easily be swapped out, enabled, or disabled, and you can easily add new listeners or remove listeners for events, the principles used to design Pong here translate to projects that are much bigger, like the voxel game engine that I've spent hundreds of hours working on at this point. For those who expect voxel engine videos from this channel, don't worry. I've been working hard on a modding system using WebAssembly and the component model, but I didn't have anything to show off this month, so I thought that this tutorial would make a good filler video. That's about it for this tutorial. Thanks for sticking with me, and leave a comment or a question down below if you have any thoughts. The full example for the Pong game that we've built is available as a part of the Geese repository. Don't forget to leave a like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.